All right, so this is the course material for a counseling class uh, that is being taught at Antioch University. I'm not quite, quite sure which campus, but you can Google the university and see that they have several. And um, supposedly it has some interesting things in it that may be woke. So this is really not, I don't want to go into it with an observation bias, but I have some already, so I'm going to acknowledge that and try to put it to the side. The main things that I'm looking for in here is what I'm referring to as what content things that are racially politically religiously or sexually oriented ideologies that break from the traditional ideas of counseling I do have some psychology from many many years ago but it's easy to identify some of the woke stuff just on keywords like inclusivity and how um, equity and equality and diversity and stuff like that that are it seems to me like, from what I can tell so far, these words are shrouds. They're like cover stories for an underlying, uh, basically, representation of the oppressed oppressor thing, which is this really weird uh, play on each group of people. One of them is unwitting, the oppressor, that doesn't really apparently understand that they're oppressing people and the woke ideology is going to come out and tell them this is what you're doing and you should acknowledge it and take responsibility for it while the oppressed people remain oppressed but never find a solution it's very interesting that um, you know CRT has been around for a long time and a lot of these things come out of that and they really do kind of push the idea that there is no solution racism is permanent and to a certain magnitude that's true because it's a thing that's happened throughout history so I think that um, people really do need to research what CRT is to get a better understanding of what some of this other stuff is. So let's just flip through the book. You can get this on Amazon. That's where I got this one. Uh, this is the ninth edition. The one that really piqued interest in this was the seventh edition. So maybe this one will have better content. All right, so let's just go ahead and take a look. And I'll probably fast forward through some of this uh, to just shorten the length of the video. But I'll get into chapter one here in just a second. I just kind of want to look through Western and non-Western perspectives, indigenous and cultural methods of healing among people of color. Okay. White racial consciousness. Implications of counseling for psychotherapy. An anti-racist white identity. Wow. Okay. Let's see here. Racial, ethnic, cultural attitudes and multicultural counseling and therapy. Racial awakening. Formative status, dissonant status. This is chapter seven. I was looking at that one. I'm kind of going backwards here. Microaggressions. The perceived minimal harm of microaggressions. I guess there is no such thing as maybe a minimal harm. That'll be interesting. The three dimensions of identity, over, general, over generalizing and stereotyping. Chapter one, emotional self-revelations, cognitive resistance. All right, let's go back over to Chapter 10, let's do uh, African Americans, Alaskan Natives. It's interesting, it has a lot to do with very specific people. What is this? It is for the culturally diverse, so I guess we're going to learn some things about other folks that we may not know about. 
Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. This is not at all, at all what I was expecting. Um, I'm not saying that it's bad either. It's, it would probably be a good idea to have a comprehensive understanding of other cultures if you're going to go into counseling. Arabs, Arab Americans, uh, multiracial Americans, immigrants and refugees, living in poverty, disabilities, older adults, LGBTQ, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe that's a typo. I don't know. Because can you see that? LGBTQ? There's TQ and TQ. That's got to be hopefully a typo. I, maybe there's something new that I don't know. Maybe there's an R now. Alright, so let's just uh, <clears throat> take a look here. I'm not going to go over the preface just right now. Part 1. And this is one of those books that reflects light. It's the kind of material that's just terrible and lighting. You have to look at it straight on to be able to read it. Reading and digesting the content of this book may prove difficult and filled with powerful feelings for many of you. Some readers find the substance of this book difficult to absorb and have reacted very strongly to the content. Maybe this version 9 here, 9th edition, is trying to address that right off the bat. According to instructors of multicultural counseling and therapy, the powerful feelings aroused in some students prevent them from being open to diversity issues and from making classroom discussions on the topic and learning a learning opportunity. Instead, conversations on diversity become shouting matches wow, or become monologues rather than dialogues. These instructors indicate that the content of the book challenges many white students about their racial, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity realities, and that the book's socio-cultural political orientation also arouses deep feelings of defensiveness, anger, anxiety, guilt, sadness, hopelessness, and a multitude of other strong emotions. As you begin the course, it's important to know that multicultural psychology is much more than intellectual exercise. It is also a journey of self-discovery filled with deep feelings about the subject matter and often uncomfortable personal revelations. So, that's really interesting. So right off the bat, we've got a book, and I'm not trying to... I'm not being biased. I mean, it literally said it. Um, right off the bat, we have isolated an entire group of people on the planet. Uh, the instructors indicate that the content of the book... Now, the instructors are the ones that are taking the blame for this, not the book. Notice that the author is saying the instructors indicate that the content of the book challenges many white students. So let's just go ahead and... I like to be perfect if I can get this line correct. Many white students about their racial, gender, sexual orientation, and other identity realities. So right there, we got a reference. And how, I guess I should start a method. Well, I'll just start doing a W every time I find a white reference. It's because it seems like that just right off says that. So let's let's continue. Uh, students who have embarked on a journey to understand this have almost universally felt both positive and negative feelings that affect their ability to learn with, learn about diversity issues. As you begin your journey to becoming a competent health professional, as counselor, the road is often filled with obstacles of self-exploration. So, the book is disqualifying itself from your problem. So this is this is your problem. P R O B. If I can write, <clears throat> it's really slick paper. Uh, we begin by sharing with you reactions by fellow classmates. Oh, this should be interesting. Uh, about their starting expectations for the course, and then their initial reactions on the content of this book. All right, let's let's see what this first one says. I hope this video doesn't go very long for just one chapter, but it's already starting to look like that because the, the information seems rather dense. 
Let me get this over here so it's better in the camera view. My counselor trainee, what are my expectations for this course? Well, I'm here to learn about counseling and therapy. I'd like information on how to work with black and Latino clients and how to work with LGBTQ clients as well. Uh, let's keep politics out of the classroom. That's what her, this per, I'm saying, I'm guessing it's her, I don't know, whoever it is, that's their last statement to keep politics out. And the training of color says, um, oh wow, I'm not even paying attention. This is immediately separating a white trainee from a trainee of color. This is an example of what we are expecting. I'm not sure what to expect, this one says. The majority of these classes have been a disappointment. It's frustrating to always tiptoe around topics of race and racism. I don't think there should be any tiptoeing at all. I think you should be um, very clear about what you think about it. But I don't think you should respond uh, negatively or emotionally. I think you should just uh, try to reason through it. That's what real critical thinking is, is the objective is to solve a problem or get to the source of what the problem uh, is, how it's, how it's being caused, and then to seek out a solution. Uh, a lot of times I see that the problem's identified, but the solution is almost flatly stated as unsolvable. So uh, many people are scared to death to talk about race and they avoid it like a hot potato. And she ends with. I get angry and upset at times, but I can't say anything because they will think I am just an angry black man. Okay. Can you explain the different? So this is just a exercise to try to get people to engage on these two different views. The white trainee seems to be implying that Learning about race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation is purely a cognitive and intellectual exercise. Emotion is antagonistic to reason. Politics should be left out. And as a white person, they may be blamed for all the racial injustices in the world. Did she say that? She does. I'm saying she. I don't know that it is. Too many times discussions on the race... On race become political, and I hope we don't wind up blaming everything on whites. Well, I guess that would be understandable if you're a white person. You wouldn't want to be blamed for everything. Um, on the other hand, the students of the color also approach the course with great trepidation. The experience is that honesty and authenticity is discussing races often absent or glossed over. Sugar-coated, dismissed, rationalized. Students of color are silenced from expressing their emotionality or fear of being labeled angry or irrational. I don't know. I, when I was in college, I, I never had that happen. Okay, and so it looks like we're going to get into some comments here. Expectations oftentimes shape the reactions to the course content, especially those in the book. Uh, and these are the reactions. So we have the white student and an African-American student's reactions. Uh, how dare you and your fellow caustic co-authors express such vital or vitriol against white Americans? You are all racist, but of a different color. What makes you think that racism comes just from whites? Minorities are equally racist. I can't believe you're our counselors. Your book does nothing but weaken our nationalism and our sense of unity and solidarity. If you don't like it, leave. Shame on you. Your book doesn't make me want to become multicultural. Okay. And the African American student says, When I first took this course, I did not have much hope that it would be different from all others in the program, white and Eurocentric. I felt it would be the typical cosmetic and superficial coverage of minority issues. Boy, was I wrong. I like what you I like that you did not tiptoe around the subject. Your book Counseling and Culture Diverse was so forceful and honest that it made me feel liberated. I feel like I had a voice and it allowed me to truly express my anger and frustration against racism and to honestly talk about what we experience on a daily basis. White folks don't seem to want to understand 
how we have been oppressed. Hang on a second, let me get rid of that fly. It's going to drive me bonkers. Uh, let's see, where was I? White folks that seem to want to understand how we have been oppressed. Some of the white students were upset, and I could see them squirming in their seats. When the professor discussed the book, I felt like saying, good, it's about time whites suffer like we have. I have no sympathy for you. It's about time they have learned to listen. Thank you, thank you, and thank you all for having the courage to write such an honest book. It's very interesting. So, these two are compared. What hot buttons are being pushed in the student? What are the strong reactions coming from in the material of this book, biased and political rhetoric? <clears throat> rhetoric? Or is the white student having his view of the world challenged? Well, the student, we've got two students here, and um, I don't think two comparisons that are probably extremely polar is a good way to describe this, but then again, the book is trying to defend what other people may have an expectation of the content. So, okay. Uh, it serves to make the student and other white students less culpable by equating one form of bias with another. And so, it's being suggested that the white student is acting out of, um, I guess they're upset because this content of this book, is ch they're saying it's challenging the white student's perspective on their own reality. Uh, and then if we come to the African-American student. Second note, the reaction from the student of color is diametrically opposed to that of the white trainee. The student reacts positively to the material. Uh, in other words, the student finds the content of the book truthful. The student of color describes how the content and tone of the book made her, him or her feel liberated. Um, him or her feel liberated. I thought this was a black man. I'm, I'm equating this student to this student over here, so it's a man in this example over here. The student of color describes, okay, we covered that. Additionally, the student seems to take pleasure in observing the discomfort of white students, expresses little sympathy for their struggles in the class, and enjoys seeing them being placed on the defensive. Okay, and it says we'll return to the meaning of that. I guess they're going to interpret that for us. But, um, you know, with anything, uh, when you're reading something like this, don't let the instructor or the text interpret anything for you. Uh, question everything. You know, if you're sitting in a classroom, this is for me from the very beginning. I can't imagine or remember how many times um, I challenged somebody in the classroom and and, you know, sometimes I was right, sometimes I was wrong, but if you don't speak up, if you speak up and then you get clobbered, I don't know. We'll see. It would be a mistake, however, to conclude that white students and students of color respond uniformly in one way. Well, that's good to know. As we will explore in future chapters, many white students react positively to the book and some students of color report negative reactions. However, in general, there are major worldview differences and reactions to the material between the groups. For example, many socially marginalized group members find solace in the book. They describe a deep sense of validation, release, elation, joy, and even feelings of liberation as they read the text. So, that's kind of strange. That describes a religious book. This literally describes a religion. They describe a deep sense of validation, release, elation, joy, and even feelings of liberation. I mean, that's that's that's, that's pretty powerful right there. Um, and it has, that rings, I mean, anybody that's in counseling or in psychology knows that that is extremely positive reinforcement and has a borderline cult aspect to it. That's just me just reading what that says. I don't know if there's any more to that or not. The important question to ask is, why do students of color react so differently from their white counterparts? Um, the short answer is that racial realities differ between groups because of differences in lived experience, just like the differences in realities between men and women, gays and straights, able-bodied and those with disabilities, Christians and Jews, and rich and poor. MCT is about being able to bridge these differences 
to relate to the worldview of culturally diverse clients, to not silence their stories. That should be very important, to not silence their stories, to listen to their narratives without becoming defensive, but most importantly, to not impose your definitions of normality and abnormality upon them. So I would hold this right here as the standard by which every other paragraph in this book is composed. If, if everything else in this book conforms to that, to those parameters, then this book shouldn't have anything woke in it. The thing that's just dis disturbing just right off the bat here is because chapter one literally begins in a defensive posture, especially in regards to white people. So they're splitting the class in half, right at the onset of the class with the content is being split in half, regardless of whether you side with one or the other, be it white or colored or uh, anything else, be it, um, you know, gender perspectives or um, roles like, uh, you know, housewife versus breadwinner, all the different kind of things that divide society that we will argue over. The book begins with a racial division on chapter one at the very first page. So that is kind of strange that they're jumping right out of the gate with that. And they're also pretty much saying that it's somebody else's problem. Specifically, I think they're trying to say it's a white person's problem if they have a negative reaction to it. Now, because you can't say that's true for everybody in any given situation, what's the old saying, you know, you can please some of the people some of the time, but not all of them all the time. So they, they come out and they say that it would be a mistake, however, to conclude that white students and students of color respond uniformly in one way. Well, we know that's true because we have extremely strong conservative black people and people of color that literally speak against the far left. And, and this does have kind of a far left feel to it, but let's just say it's a liberal view um, and not the far left. Because I make that distinction in another video when I actually explain what my views on that are. And go look at that video, I'll leave it in the comments. So this is kind of strange. Uh, I'm going to keep reading um, until I get to the end of chapter one, and I'm going to show what highlights I found, and then I'll be back. All right. Um, I've got some notes throughout the chapter, and I'm just going to go over some of them. This is probably going to wind up longer than I wanted it to, because there's a lot to unpack in just chapter one. I wanted to start off with telling a story, because the course material actually does encourage that, so I figure I might as well participate with it. Um, when I was growing up, you know, we had colored kids on the street, uh, Mexicans and African Americans. We also had, um, the Romani or Gypsies, um, those times, sometimes those get conflated. And it wasn't uncommon for any group of parents to refer to the other groups of kids by a, a racial slur, including me and my family. And uh, so it wasn't on, on often for me to encounter being called a honky or a cracker as a little boy. Now, to be perfectly honest, I had no clue what a cracker was or what it meant, and I may be still wrong. There was a movie that came out um, years ago with Matthew McConaughey in it, and there was a scene where some NAACP guys are going on, and they called somebody a cracker, and I didn't get it. And after seeing the movie more than once, I finally decided to go look it up. And um, so for most of my life, I didn't even know what that meant. And I also recall as a boy asking, why am I being called a honky? And it never mattered because it never had a negative connotation. I wasn't taught that it did. And for the most part, after being told that it was meaningless, I ignored it from then on out. So I guess that's a, a hurtful thing for some people, but I've never encountered another white person that was offended by it. So right off the bat, the first thing that I would think of, since a lot of this seems to be really racially driven, is a question that I would ask <clears throat> if I was in this class. Why is it that you cannot uh, raise a racial slur against a white person? Why doesn't it work? And I would say probably because white parents don't teach their kids to respond or react to it or that it has any meaning. So why would, I guess why would somebody have a negative reaction if they weren't taught that? Uh, maybe that's a breakdown 
that this doesn't cover, but I think that for me, I never experienced it because I was basically told to dismiss it. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and look through this here. Uh, so we had these two trainees, or actually maybe four. I think some clarification later in the book said that these were four different people. And I'm just going to start reading where I've outlined. Uh, Learning about race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation is purely a cognitive and intellectual exercise. Uh, emotion is antagonistic to reason. Politics should be left outside of the classroom. This is what the book is saying a white person's perspective on this material is. Um, a colored person's um, perspective is their experience is that honesty and authenticity is in discussing race issues are often absent or glossed over, um, that they're discussed and they're sugar-coated, avoided, dismissed, or rationalized, and that students of color are silenced from expressing their emotionality for fear of being labeled angry or irrational. Now, this is interesting because if we jump over to page 14, because it's saying here that colored folks are going to be silenced because expressing their emotionality, there's a fear of being labeled angry or irrational. And if we go over to page 14, we're told something different over here. The fact that the student uh, chose not to voice his or her thoughts is actually an impediment to learning and understanding. In many classrooms, teachers have noticed how silence is used by some white students to mask or conceal their thoughts and feelings about multicultural issues. So, one moment it's colored folks, and then over here on this page, it's white people that are doing it. So there has to be some fundamental reason what the difference is. Um, so we're going to get into that in a minute. But one of the reasons that I think that if this is true for white people is because they're literally being called out. Um, they're being told that they're all these bad things and there's a great deal of negative reinforcement on them. And if the room has got you know other people, the marginalized and the colored people, then they're going to be kind of meek in the midst of that discussion. How can, you know, this book is encouraging discussion. And how is that going to fly if they're on the onset saying that it's not going to? But we'll continue. Um, on this next one, uh, this one's for me a maybe a dictatorship thing. It is obvious that the student feels that this book is biased and propagandistic. Uh, the language used by the student seems to indicate defensiveness and the material covered in the book is easily dismissed as political indoctrination. Okay, so one of the first things that indoctrination gets around or, or, or actually focuses on is often politics. You know, you often see in the classroom, and I refer to classroom dictatorship, that's one of the greatest forms of a dictatorship because you're going to do what the instructor tells you to. You're going to... Uh, get the grade under the with the understanding that you will either capitulate with the teaching tool or you will pretend to. So you're going to go along with it if you want the grade. If you don't, you're probably not going to get the grade you wanted. So there is a indoctrination and it is a political one if the instructor has a political perspective. And you can't have a racial issue without a political perspective because politicians make it as such. It's how they it's how they campaign. So it's an unfortunate connection between the two, and it came out of the critical race theory framework. Um, down here, in the second note, that the reaction from the student of color is diametrically opposed to that of the white trainee. This student reacts positively to the material, finds the content helpful in explaining his or her experiential reality, and feels validated and affirm reaffirmed. So the book is telling us that for colored folks, this is a great course material that they're really going to like it. And we can see page 18. Um, this is the, this is what white people will affect uh, or feel. Uh, they include sadness, disappointment, humiliation, blame, and invalidation. So just on the onset, this ch first chapter is a disclaimer to the, to the population of the classroom. All you people that fall into the um, diverse group, the marginalized group, uh, you're going to be over here and you're really going to love this course material and all you white folks over here, you're really going to not like it. So that's that's kind of what this first chapter is telling us here. 
and let's see I'm going to skip that for now because I don't know I think this is a positive thing just like differences in realities between men and women gays and straights able-bodied and those with disabilities Jews and Christians and rich and poor is about uh, being able to bridge these differences to relate to the worldview of culturally diverse clients, to not silence their stories, to listen to their narratives without becoming defensive. Those are great points. I agree with that completely. I'm not from a counseling background, but I understand why that would definitely be a proactive you know, thing that you want to do. Uh, as you shortly see, this book's subject matter deals with prejudice, bias, and stereotyping, discrimination, and bigotry, makes a strong case that counseling and psychotherapy may serve as instruments of cultural oppression rather than therapeutic liberation. That just is ludicrous. And I'll say it again. As you will shortly see, the book's subject matter deals with prejudice, bias, stereotyping, discrimination, and bigotry. Those are all things that need to be, you know, we need to address those. Makes a strong case that counseling and psychotherapy, which have been around for ages, may serve as instruments of cultural oppression. So we're going to kick we're going to kick out counseling and psychotherapy because they are culturally oppressive rather than therapeutic. I guess if you've got a bad counselor, that's that's the truth. Um or a therapist, but I don't think that we can qualify all of that um uh, science into that sentence. That's that's kind of damning unconsciously biased uh, toward clients from marginalized groups so we don't want them we don't want our therapists or trainees to fall into that okay uh, if these feelings persist throughout the course unabated they will act as barriers to learning and further self-exploration so basically if you have a problem with this text and the course material and if you have an instructor that is heavily slanted one way or the other uh, it's your problem and you're not going to get anything done you're not going to be able to complete self-exploration. So the, the book is damning towards people that find any fault in it. Uh, and there's no real wiggle room for getting out of that. Now, this is an interesting uh, reaction. Uh, you should probably read that one for yourself. I'm not going to read the whole thing because we're I'm trying to get through on some time here. Um, cultural competence and humility in counseling, mental health practice demands that nested or embedded emotions associated with race, culture, gender, and other social identity differences be openly experienced and discussed. Now, openly is the key word, and we want to do that. But the book's already telling the audience, the reader, that that's not likely to happen. On the onset of this, you're going to experience either elation from the course material, or you're going to be oppressed. And that means the white people are actually getting oppressed because of whatever these feelings that they have over here on the page. What was it? Sadness, disappointment, humiliation, blame, and invalidation. I don't know how I would approach that. You know, I'm, I'm right now I'm just saying, okay, I'm going to try to go through the course material as if I was in the class. Um, I think it's funny that this expression over here about cultural oppression from therapy is kind of saying that well, you didn't know you didn't know. Um, so you're wrong no matter what. And if you try to say that you're right, then that's just proof that you're wrong. And there's no way for you to be right unless you categorically agree with the content of the course material, which is very uh, self-affirming prophecy. It's, it's the uh, Sarah Connor thing in Terminator. You know, it's, a, it's something you can't, you can't prove. You can't really stand it up on anything, but... <laughs> You can say it over and over enough times that you're going to convince somebody that that's the case. And by the way, this is just a book that I have back here so that I could draw lines. I'm not referencing any other material. Um, let's see, what do we got down here? I now realize that Sue was right. The system had been destructive toward people of color, and although my ancestors and I had not directly been part of that oppressive system, I had unknowingly contributed to it. So, it says, I was both a product and an architect of a racist culture. Okay, so that's universally true throughout time. There's no way to get away with it or get away from it because you're going you're to be doing it and getting away with it whether you want to or not, consciously or unconsciously. 
there is racism permeated throughout the timeline since the beginning of the written record. And my, my best analogy would be to find a blank spot here. I'm going to do it on this corner. This is from a previous video. You know, if you had a society of people and these people had green eyes and these people had blue eyes and this group had brown eyes and no other feature was different between these three groups of people all over the planet. They all had the same skin color. They were all the same height. Maybe there were men and women, whatever the case may be, but the race of humans we're talking about here they all had these three distinct qualities and that's it. That's all they had. You would eventually find a coalition between two of the groups. And that two group would have probably eventually discriminate against the third. If humans have this thing built into them that they automatically um, classify other groups of people, that is racism. Racism is when you take a group of people and you say, I don't like these people for these reasons, and here's the common features that they have. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it, to look at it from the perspective of skin color takes away from the deeper analysis of what racism is. Now, given in America that probably is the primary subject matter because of America's history, but if you were to condemn all of white people um, or, or want them to feel that way because of something that happened in the past, then you would have to equally apply that same logic to everybody else whose ancestors had done something to the similar magnitude in the past. So if you could think of <clears throat> any other group of people in the last thousand years that significantly oppressed another group of people, you would have to hold them as equally responsible in the same factor that this book is trying to make the distinction between white people and everybody else, which is really strange. I, I don't know why they uh, focus so narrowly on that, but that seems to be the case with critical race theory, that every time you see it evolve into, into a activism thing, it's always the marginalized and particularly people of color against white people. And it's interesting to note that the marginalized people include also women, gay, trans, lesbian, and so on. But they're kind of... Uh, made into a somewhat lesser group than the color group, it seems like, from this. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But it leaves out one interesting thing. It's kind of funny. You would think that a book on counseling, the culturally diverse, would uh, at some point directly, or at least to some magnitude, mention white men. White men haven't appeared once in this first chapter. It is all marginalized, which doesn't include white men apparently, and uh, people of color, which obviously white men are out. But the idea of whiteness exists. And if you're white and you disagree with this, then there's something wrong with your perception. And this book is going to help you fix that. And if you're not white and you're in the marginalized or people of color group, but you have a mentality of the white person, then you're still white. So you could be a gay black man that doesn't agree with this text, and you're too white. That's that's what this that's what I'm getting from this so far. So let's keep going. Um, now here's here's an interesting one. Um, it's important to note Marx's open admission to racist thoughts. This is because he wrote a little paragraph up here. This is a quote from him. Uh, he realized that discussing race and racism is so difficult for many white Americans because they are racked with guilt about how people of color have been treated in the United States. That is an absolute... I, I can't... I don't know anybody that feels guilty. Racked with guilt? Why, why would somebody be racked with guilt? I'm not... I don't feel guilty for things that happened in the past. I didn't do them. I don't think that anybody in the modern time, hopefully feels guilt for something that their ancestors did. If they do, then that right there is a counseling issue for that person about why they carry somebody else's guilt. They're imposing somebody else's guilt onto their own self. They were born innocent into the world. They didn't inherit that. I mean, unless you want to do the sins of the father thing. But this is ludicrous to say that people feel guilty. Maybe there's some people out there that actually feel guilty. 
I would hope that they wouldn't die. I would hope that they would be confident and secure in themselves knowing that some other idiot in their past did something terrible and that it's not their fault. For to them to take on that blame is an insurmountable task. So there's no way they would ever be able to get away from that. Um, and this goes back to how kids were raised, why you can't really raise a racial slur against white people because they just don't seem to care. Why do other, why do the marginalized people or, or the oppressed people, what is it in their makeup, their psychological makeup, that causes them to be offended or to care in the first place if somebody didn't teach it to them? Uh, I, that's a weird thing for me to try to chew on because I don't understand it. But maybe as I move through this, I'll change my mind and I'll understand something that I haven't in the past. Um, let's see what I have here. So from this part right here, um, as we can see from the students of color, many marginalized group members react equally strongly as their white counterparts when issues of oppression are raised, especially when their stories of discrimination and pain are minimized or neglected. Now, the reality of racism, sexism, and homophobia they contend is relatively unknown or ignored by those in power because of the discomfort that pervades the subjects. I don't think there's any discomfort. Uh, at this point in our society in 2022, about to be 23, I don't think it's a case of it. Um, where was I reading? Uh, being something that they don't want to deal with. I think they're just sick and tired of it. I mean, you know, after a while, enough's enough, and, and material like this, it, it seems to want to bring it back and magnify it, and instead of letting the people that are done with it heal and continue on so that the next generation can be born and feel no blame and, and, and be at peace with each other and the culturally diverse. But this, so far, it seems to be a tool for pointing out the slightest discrepancy between the two groups, again, all white people versus people of color and the marginalized, and magnifying with great intensity how different they are. And it's just, it doesn't seem to be very constructive, but maybe that is a necessary thing for a counselor to comprehend when they're dealing with a client. Um, but either way, the white people in here there is no reprieve for them. There is no way for them to uh, be non-racist because the minute they say that a person says, well, I'm not racist, that's a huge indicator that, well, you've definitely got something wrong with you because you don't realize how racist you are. And that's the message. So I would kind of comprehend why somebody in the classroom, if there was one white person or even a dozen, would maintain some degree of silence, one for their grade. I mean, right there off the bat, you don't want to get a bad grade. And that's the reality of going to a university or a college. When you speak up against a teacher, you might as well go ahead and give yourself a D. Um, think about this. Uh, one of my math classes, I remember one time I had an, a math instructor write this on the board. Uh, joking not. And um, she was doing an equation. She wrote 22 divided by 7 and called that pi. And I was like, that's not pi. And she kept going on the equation. I said, that's not pi. And it bothered me because everybody in the classroom was going to believe that that's true. And it's not. This is, this is an approximation. The correct definition of pi isn't even close to that. Well, she got mad at me and finally challenged me. And I told her, and she says, come out and work it on the board. And I did. And when I finished, it wasn't pi. And I didn't have to take my midterm exam because of that. But let me tell you what, after that, that instructor and I did not see eye to eye. And if it weren't for the cold, hard facts of math only working out one way, I wouldn't have passed the class. Because when it came down to it, if I got the answer right, there was no disputing it. If you get the answer right or wrong in this, this is so unbelievably subjective material that the instructor can just say, well, you're just not going to fit in. You're not going to be able to absorb the material, you have an emotional problem, and it even, the book even tells you that, and we'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> so, uh, let's go over here. Uh, the lived experience of people of color is generally invisible to most white Americans, as the quotation portrays, as we will discuss in chapter four, racial, gender, and sexual orientation. Microaggressions are experienced frequently by people of color, women, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons. 
and their day-to-day -day interactions with well-intentioned members of the dominant society. And I, I like to have they say dominant society. So you have to you have to prove that and declare what its parameters are. But forget this part. Notice that it mentioned people of color, women, lesbian, gay, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. But men are left out. This is a very serious book on supposedly counseling. But men are not included and the culturally diverse. How did that happen? You've literally split all of the society in half right down the middle when you left men out. That's pretty remarkable. That's unbelievable that that is not in here. As a matter of fact, it's not. I don't think there's one mention of men in here in the first chapter at all. So let's go on. Uh, name calling. Uh, this is where I get back to when I was a kid and somebody would call me honker or cracker and I just dismissed it. Um, I know my dad has a lot of white friends and they get un they get comfortable with him and they s say really insulting things like they call him a wagon burner or a dirty Indian. This is talking about really bad um, behavior in front of children that just shouldn't be seen but it happens nonetheless and my thought on this was why why did somebody feel negatively about name calling Name calling to me was a a uh, I guess a challenge a growing up challenge to in, into maturity to you get to the point where you just ignore the immature name calling but apparently it seems to hold on to some people and the, and name calling is a is a bad thing be it a racist name or or not you know you can still call somebody a a stupid butthead and you've called him a bad name or whatever and it not be a racial slur but the racial slur really seems to stick out all right so given the fact that the majority of people of color have experienced microaggressions how did they uh, get that the majority of people of, of color people have experienced microaggressions how do we know that the majority of all people haven't experienced microaggressions it it seems to me that everybody in the world has experienced them. I can't, quant I can't quantify that one group has done it more than another. I don't even know how you would run numbers on that or get a report. Even if you were to go out and start asking people, I, that's, that's not something I can do with science. And that's my cat over there sneezing. All right, so let's go on. Uh, Laundra's story voices a continuing saga of how persons of color and many marginalized individuals, listen to this, many marginalized individuals must function in an ethnocentric society that unintentionally invalidate their experiences and enforces science upon them. So the marginalized, which are the, the women, the gay, lesbian, those groups of people, they're subject to the ethnocentric part of things as well as the people of color. It's a weird comparison, but okay, we'll go ahead and go with that. Um, and then down here, this this blew me away. A word of caution. I, I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm going to read the conclusion down here. As people of color, for example, we, that's interesting, he said we, that means the author, I'm guessing. Maybe it's an inclusive we, as in an inclusive you. We must realize that our, again, first person, for our group, I guess. It'd be, it'd be bad if he said my. But enemies are not white Americans, but white supremacy. So I'll say it again. As, white, as people of color, for example, we must realize that our enemies are not white Americans, but white supremacy. Moreover, by extension, our enemy, there's enemy again, is not white Western society, but racism and ethnocentrism. So it's interesting because the book is actually calling out the enemy. Enemy? Does that mean you're going to go get them? Um, <laughs> what do you do with the enemy? What a strange word to use in a counseling book. Enemy. Okay. 
As we will see in chapter 8, people of color, for example, are not immune from prejudice, bias, and discrimination. I'm glad that they made that obvious. I would think this would be true for all of humankind, not just for people of color. This is an axiomatic statement. This means it's true, it's flat out true for everybody. To quantify it with people of color is literally discrimination, right in its own manner. Race, culture, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation and identity are about everyone, and here we go, we're correcting ourselves. Instead of people of color, there should have been everyone, but down here we're going to, oh, we better fix that, everyone. It is not just a minority thing. So you'll read a little bit, you know, and then you'll find on another page, oh, we need to look at this from another perspective. And for people that aren't paying attention to what they're reading, they're literally kind of being programmed into double talk. They've got two different perspectives coming at the same time, and you have an ex there's an expectation that you're going to believe both of them, I guess. So let's go over here to this little discussion thing. Um, as you continue reading the material in this text, you're likely to experience strong and powerful reactions and emotions. Being able to understand the meaning of your feelings is the first step in cultural competence. And it says, many marginalized group members find that their voices are silenced or unheard. No kidding. I wouldn't want to speak out. Are their perceptions correct? If not, how do you explain their feelings? The book is actually asking you to empathize with somebody else's feelings and come up with an explanation of why they feel that way. My first explanation on why somebody has an emotional reaction to something, especially in this kind of context, is because they're just not, and this is me, they are not a fully, I don't want to say developed person, I guess they have not gone through enough time of introspection to literally know thyself and it's kind of funny because somewhere in here there's a quote about the therapist knowing thyself here it is the old adage counselor or therapist know thyself okay the old adage doesn't have counselor and therapist words in it, it the word the know thyself thing comes from what is that that's greek at the temple of apollo and delphi or something or something like that that's an ancient saying from the greeks they stuck this counselor or therapist thing onto the front of it i think I'm, I'm not quite sure how that got there. But to be able to go in <clears throat> and stop and try to explain somebody else's feelings that's having a problem, I would say, I don't know why you're having a problem with it. I don't want you to. Maybe calm down and let's look at it, you know, from a logical perspective. But if you do that, then you're guilty of this one saying that learning about race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation is purely a cognitive or intellectual exercise. Is this book not a cognitive or intellectual exercise? If it's not, and it's an exercise in something else, then how in the world or am, I, am I supposed to apply it with any concrete boundaries or parameters that I can universally distribute over all people? The book's telling me that I can't. It's telling me that I have to look at it through the lens of colored people and marginalized people versus all white people. That's what I'm getting so far. So let's keep going on. <clears throat> this one kind of gets me. Do you think it is possible to leave politics outside of the classroom when discussing racism, uh, sexism, homophobia? Is it possible to not consider the sociopolitical nature of counseling and psychotherapy when working with marginalized group members? So if you have a client, and I'm going to guess this is what would happen, and the client comes in, and you're the counselor, and the client's really upset about politics, then politics is on the table because you're there to counsel them, and whatever the problem is is rooted in politics. But in the classroom, when you're learning how to be the counselor, and don't think that it should be raised up necessarily that, well, did you hear what this such-and-such -such candidate did, or did you hear about this new law that was passed? This is a indoctrination process because now you've gone from teaching the class to teaching politics and if the politics or the instructor of the instructor um, are a certain way then they're going to create students that have that political view and so when those students go out into the world they have a political stance that formed out of their learning now if the school knows that and they push a certain mentality in politics then you're literally changing the course of how people behave and react to the way that laws are made, 
and everything else. Should the classroom be doing that? Or should the student take a class on politics because they're going into politics to learn that subject matter? I, that's up for interpretation to me. That's that's, indoctr that's indoctrination of politics, but okay. In many aspects, uh, to be uncomfortable and to experience negative reactions to the uh, material may be signs of potential growth. So that's okay. That's a good statement. There's a lot of times where I'm, I'm, I'm encountering something and it's new and I may not like it, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again anyway. And if I get through it, I may get something out of it. So that's, that's okay. Cognitive resistance, emotional resistance, and behavioral resistance are all the things that are going to get in your way. And that's what they're going to go over next. And <clears throat> this one is interesting because um, it's about the three things that just mentioned. Cognitive, emotional, and uh, this next page is behavioral. And this one up here is talking about alternative views. And this person's saying, you know, every time I hear somebody say that you know, I couldn't do this because of some racial thing that happened to me, then this person will say, well, maybe here's an alternative explanation. And so then they come to some realization that, oh, they were just denying their, uh, their unconscious racism by suggesting an alternative view. And it's kind of funny because if you read through this, you kind of get the impression that, well, if you're having an alternative view on anything, it must be because you're, or you're the oppressor to some magnitude. So it's self-reinforcing because as long as you cooperate with the mindset, you're good to go. The minute that you raise a question about the content, the, the book is literally telling you that you've got a problem. You have an emotional difficulty with accepting the fact of the matter of what they're telling you is the truth, the gospel truth, and there's no questioning it. It's carved in stone, and to try to change the wording of it or change the interpretation of it means that you're that there's something wrong with you. That's very, that's very non-clinical and non-professional, I think, but we're going to continue on. And I'm sure that whoever's watching this thinks that I went into this to tear it apart, and I honestly didn't. I didn't expect it to be this overt. I really thought that these first few chapters were going to be just straightforward counseling, and that maybe this kind of stuff would start appearing further into the book. But it's literally in the first chapter. <clears throat> because of a strong belief that racism is a thing of the past, we live in a post-racial society, and that equal access and opportunity are open to everyone. Now i got to ask you a question. Right on that one. This, they're saying that this is not true. The, you know, that, it's, that people of color are seen as exaggerating and misperceiving situations and they're saying that I guess that white people in this case think that you know it's all cool we're done with the racism stuff it's over with let's put it behind us but the text is contending that that's not the case so on this one I would ask a question to anybody that's watching answer me this one except for the fact that white men can get away with anything what are the top 10 privileges that white men can do what can they do that no one else can do. There's gotta be at least 10 of them for it to be a big deal. So just think of what are the top 10 things that white men can do that no one else can do. Maybe we'll isolate it to America since this seems to be the case, but for the most part anywhere, what are those top 10 things? I, I challenge you to think of them because I can't. I can't think of any privilege that I have that the rest of society doesn't have. Now I can, through some analysis on that, because I actually had to sit and think about that for a while, and try to figure out what in the world is it that they're saying privilege is. And I think I, I've come to a conclusion on that. I think that privilege means, from their perspective, that you've got something special. And I think that they're right. But I don't think the special thing that white, especially white men have, that nobody else seems to have, is just pure self-confidence and not giving a flip about what anybody else thinks about them. It is literally a self-worth and self-concept. If you think that you're oppressed, guess what? You're oppressed. Um, no one can oppress you, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it in America, if you don't want to be. 
there's too many uh, opportunities and availabilities for all of Americans for anybody to quantify themselves or qualify themselves as oppressed. Can you prove that you're oppressed? Uh, can you prove that you're privileged? So the strong belief that racism is a thing of the past and that we live in a post-racial society, maybe that's true for many people except for the people that believe this content. Maybe if the people that believe this content would be privileged by changing their mind, then they wouldn't be oppressed anymore. I don't know. In many classrooms, teachers have noted how silence is used by some white students to mask or conceal their true thoughts and feelings about multicultural issues. We covered that one a while ago when they said the opposite over here that, um, that students of color are silenced from expressing their emotionality for fear of being labeled angry or irrational. So you, if, this if this holds true, then the whole classroom is completely silent. Nobody talks. <clears throat> that white Americans occupy an advantage and privileged position, that they hold power over the people of color and even denial that they are white. So this is almost suggesting that the people of color have voluntarily put them into put themselves into a position of being oppressed by white people. And a while ago, they were saying something to the effect that it wasn't white America that we were concerned with. And didn't they tell us that when they were telling us who the enemy was? Let's see. Our enemy is not white Western society, but racism and ethnocentrism. Um, and our white enemies are not white Americans, but white supremacy. But here, white America occupy an advantage that and privileged position that they hold power over people of color. So they kind of vacillate between what they want to say is and isn't. So there's a lot of not a lot of consistency so far. So this one's an interesting one. This, is, this one's for explaining the student science. When someone pushes racism into my awareness, I feel guilty that I could be doing so much more. Angry, I don't like to feel like I'm wrong. Defensive, I already have two black friends. I worry more about racism than most whites do. Isn't that enough? Turned off, I have another. I have other priorities in my life uh, with guilt about that thought. Helpless, and so on. And so, you know, if I felt all of those things in the classroom, I wouldn't want to talk either. So, are we dealing with immature students? Is that what's going on? Do you have a classroom of people that have not maturated emotionally, spiritually, and all the other ways that makes them be able to speak up and say, you know, I don't agree with this. This is nonsense. I'm going to take this side. Maybe that's the case if you've got a classroom with a political perspective on one side. It was already, we already talked about that. And, and literally feel like if they say anything, they're going to fail the class. This is a Remember, this is for a young lady that's taking her uh, master's or finishing out her master's, and she got through this. Uh, I think it was um, not the ninth edition, but I think she had the seventh edition. And I seriously doubt it had an apologetic chapter one like this one does. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to have anything to do with the class, and it's for dang sure that I wouldn't want to try to implement these in a counseling session. Um, you're probably gonna. I don't know. I'm not a counselor, so I'll give you that. Anxiety is the primary subjective emotion encountered by white trainees exposed to multi multicultural content and its implications. In one study, it was found that when racial dialogues occurred, nearly all students described fears of verbal participation because they could be misunderstood or be perceived as racist. Okay, keep up with me. The primary subjective emotion encountered by white trainees, all students. Others went further in describing having to confront the realization that they held stereotypes, biases, and prejudices towards people of color. So the people of color aren't included as all students. And again, we've isolated the classroom and we split everybody in half. <clears throat> this is called demoralization. <clears throat> when you have a group of people 
and for some, whatever reason they will listen to you and you can split them in half and keep them in the same place, you are demoralizing both sides. If you can take a group of people of any kind and you can, through some very interesting, um, I would say cunning approaches, you can split them in half and have half of them believing against the other half and you're going to demoralize both of them, even if one feels superior than the other one, because you have separated humans from humans. And when you, when you do that to human beings, you demoralize them even if you're building them up or breaking them down. So this is just completely immature. This, is a, this represents an immaturity of people to be able to express themselves with any, any clarity about who they are internally and be able to say, y'all are full of nonsense. And this is how it really is, but if you do that, you're going to fail the class. The apprehension they felt affected them physically as well. It would me too. I would be mad, and I would probably, you know, your blood pressure is going to go up. You're going to lose focus on what the real thing is happening in front of you, because this is smoke and mirrors so far. This one I just wrote bullshit on. <clears throat> Talking about race, gender, and sexual orientation with culturally diverse clients often results in extreme tension and anxiety. Why would you be discussing these things with a client in the first place? Hopefully, most of the time, you're not going to have to deal with those, but maybe, maybe that's a more common thing nowadays. Discomfort and racial dialogues make, may make the helping professional's verbalization tentative, obtuse, abstract, and filled with nonsense or nonsensical nonsensical utterances. In an attempt to avoid being seen as racist or sexist, the therapist may reveal difficulties in articulation, barely audible speech, voice constriction, trembling voices, stammering and stuttering, and a mispronunciation of common words. That's called non-professionalism. They're just, they don't have their act together. They're not professionals. And they, I'm even stuttering now. They can't be, they, they're not capable of formulating a thought, completing a premise, and communicating you know, meaningfully with the client. So, hopefully that's not many people. All right, let's go on to this one. <clears throat> this is a blame thing. One's fearing, fear of appearing racist or offensive thus undermines learning because one remains silent in discussion and allows others to do the difficult work of self-exploration. Okay, listen, oftentimes, the brunt of the work is then unduly put on the shoulders of the people of color or other marginalized group members in the class. So we're blaming everybody <laughs> that's white. It's another blame game. Although defensiveness and anger are two different emotions, notice this, and I say, there's no way, there's no way to get out of it. These, the people that are feeling the defensiveness and anger they don't have anywhere they can go. They have to stay in the class. They have to complete their course study. They have to get their grade. It's part of their degree. They've invested, you no know, tell them how many tens of thousands of dollars, if not a hundred thousand or more, and you've boxed them into a corner and they're gonna cooperate or they're not gonna get their degree. This is cruel and unusual punishment in, in my definition because there is no way for them to get away from, the, get away from this. White students seem to interpret this as a personal accusation, you think? And rather than reach out to understand the content, in other words, it's their problem for not comprehending why they're racist, respond in a defensive and protective posture. Okay, that's okay if you want to say that, but you have to give me an answer. You have to show me step one, two, three to how to, how to overcome this, and they try that here later on. The problem with critical race theory is that it more often creates an activism out of the argument, but never proposes or even suggests a course of action that would lead to a solution in, in the first place. So critical thinking, the primary objective is, is we want to solve the problem. We want to analyze it and solve it. Um, but this just wants to analyze it and analyze it and analyze it and just keep analyzing it and just don't do anything else but analyze it. We're never gonna to get to a solution because if we do, then this goes away and we don't need it anymore. And we can't have that happen because it's a massively powerful political tool. 
When discussing diversity issues, many white trainees admit to feeling guilty, although most tend to say that they are made to feel guilty by people of color. I don't know any white people that are made to feel guilty by people of color. I know course material that'll do it, but I don't know any people of color personally, nor have I ever known, that made me or anybody else feel guilty because we are white. And it says many white trainees admit to feeling guilty. I don't, I don't believe that. I, I absolutely think that that's wrong. I believe that's a lie. And it's also a self-fulfilling argument. Uh, because, look at this, if indeed they are not racist, this is talking about white people, why should white trainees feel guilty when topics of race, racism or whiteness are discussed if they indeed are not racist? In other words, if you're not a racist and not responsible for the racial sins of the past, why would you be? Why would you be responsible for the past? and not responsible for current injustices. The current injustices? Show me <laughs> where there aren't injustices in the world. They're all over the place. There's no single person that can do anything about this except say into themselves, I'm not going to participate. And if you get enough people doing that, then maybe you can sway the injustices. But you're placing a massive load on a single person. Then why should they feel guilt if they're not racist and they're not responsible? Then why should they feel guilt and how could they be made to feel guilty? Well, I would say because you're shaming them. I mean, if you walk into the house and somebody's sitting there and they go, shame on you! And they shame you and shame you and shame you and don't even tell you why, eventually they're going to feel guilty for something because there can't be a reason for you shaming them unless they've done something even if they don't know what they've done. That is, that is pure psychological warfare. That is literally psyops BS. If you go and you shame somebody over and over and over and you don't even tell them why you're shaming them, they will develop a sense of guilt even though they don't know why. That is just the way that human beings are. So if you're going to tell white people that they're going to come into this class and you're going to give them a chapter of one morning that they're going to feel bad taking the class, guess what? You've planted the seed in their psyche and they will feel the way that you're prescribing it to them and you will divide them in half. What is that, what was that uh, experiment that they did? I'll have to look it up. It was, I don't remember what it was. Anyway, they took a class of kids and they separated them into prisoners and to guards. And it was to see how their behavior changed. And pretty soon, the prisoner kids that were just normal, they all, they were, they were classmates, they were friends. And pretty soon, all the ones that were in the prisoner aspect became submissive and, you know, they acted like prisoners. And the guards became loud and abusive. And these, these were originally people that got along with each other. But you put them into that situation, a paradigm. It's like the guy pushing the button. And every time he hears the button or the button buzzes, this guy in the next room screams and he hears the scream. But he keeps pushing the button because he's told to. This is the kind of stuff that you're looking at. So if you're a student and you're into your class and you're taking this, realize that you're, you're the guy pushing the button. And they're making you do it with the, with the <laughs> with this really strange book. All right, so let's keep going. <clears throat> um, we're almost done. We got another page or so. Uh, let's see this one. How does one break rules of social condemnation? What must I do to eradicate racism in the broader society? So this is the behavioral resistance, and this is actually where they're getting into actually asking questions about. Well, how do, I, how do I fix myself? And if you get into this point, and you've read chapter one, and you've bought into any of this, you're going to start feeling right here empathy for the color of people and the marginalized, regardless if you're colored or white, or marginalized or not. This has all been built up to make you feel this way. And they're going to suggest what you have to do to overcome your problem from not fully capturing and integrating the rest of this into your being. This is brainwashing. It is literally anybody that reads this that doesn't have critical thinking in their heart and understands how to deconstruct something and put it back together and find the fallacies in it. They're going to they're going to fall for this. And if you can get them to get past this point, and that's probably what chapter 1 is for, is a desensitization to what is coming later because if chapter 1 is this then I don't know what to expect from the rest. 
Um, and then here's another one. It says, hopelessness is, fe hopelessness is a feeling of despair and giving up. A self-belief that no action will matter and no solution will work. Helplessness and hopelessness associated with the need for change and action can be paralytic. The excuse for inaction and thus the avoidance of racial exploration resides not simply in knowing what to do, but in some very basic fears eloquently expressed by, and then we get a little paragraph here. This is specific to people that feel hopeless. So if you're reading this, and you feel this way by now, from reading what came in the previous pages, remember that you may not have started out hopeless, but you may be feeling hopeless by the time you get to this point. So, that's, bad. that's a bad thing to have in your heart. And this should be specific to people that experience hopelessness. You should not be experiencing hopelessness. Um, there are many other powerful emotions often experienced by students during the journey. This is again, they include sadness, disappointment, humiliation, blame, and validation. And here's a part that I actually thought was okay. Uh, years after this work is a intergroup dialogue facilitator, Reese reflected that the experience had a big impact on his development and influenced his perspectives. We are aware that the content of this chapter has probably already pushed hot emotional buttons in many of you. Okay, so now they're going to apologize for trainees in the, in the dominant group. I love it. We are asked the following questions. Are you willing to look at yourself to examine your assumptions, your attitudes, your conscious and unconscious behaviors, the privileges you enjoy, and I want to know what the privileges are. Remember, we got 10 things to list. Remember it. I need to see. Can you think of them? 10 privileges. White men, things that they can do that no one else can do. What are those 10 things that white men can do that no one else can do? The, the privileges you enjoy as a dominant group member. What are they talking about? And and how you may have unintentionally treated others in, le in less than a respectful manner. For socially marginalized group members, we ask whether you are willing to confront your own biases and prejudices towards dominant group members. What in the world, man? Be honest in acknowledging your own biases towards other socially devalued group members. How am I supposed to know that? I mean, did people are people putting on you know a sticker on their shirt that says, "I identify as this, this, and I have these um, oppressive features or or oppressed features." That's just strange. So let's come over here. I think we've got, we've got one more. Yeah, this is one, two more things. Um, implications for clinical practice. Know that although you were not born wanting to be racist, I love this, we were innocent when we were born. Sexist or heterosexist, I'm not even familiar with that one, or to be prejudiced against any other group, your cultural conditioning, here it is, has imbued certain biases and prejudices in you. No portion of group is free from inheriting the biases of U.S. society. And we're going to focus on the United States for some reason. This book is really about, it focuses on America a lot for some reason. All right, so here we go again. This goes back to my example with the green eyes, the blue eyes, and the brown eyed people. And that we classify people. This is just the nature of the human being. We've been doing it for thousands of years. There's no getting away from it. But this book will probably not acknowledge that. It may later on, but I'd be willing to bet you that they're going to focus specifically on very stark dichotomies that are in America. And it's true. You are going to inherit those from who? You're going to get it from your parents. So if you see a bunch of white people that are privileged, that don't care if you call them bad names, and you can't raise a racial slur against them, and, and I guess that's kind of basically it. The reason that that is is because their parents told them nothing bad about it. They didn't say, you know, honky means this or cracker means that. They didn't put it in their hearts to find offense in it. If you put in a children's heart, in a child's heart, a definition of what offensive is, um, they will latch onto it and then they will start adding it onto everything else. And so the first best destiny is just to not teach it to children in the first place. But I don't see how that part of it applies to you know, the counseling and the client, because surely the counselor is not going to put anything racist in the heart of the client. If the counselor were to sit down with a client and say, for instance, well, I'm white, 
and let's say you have a client that's black and I've been your oppressor for thousands of years or hundreds of years or whatever this thing's going to claim, how does that make you feel? You've literally introduced that idea into the client's mind. The client may have come in and been one of the black white people for all you know. Why would you raise that kind of a discussion with somebody just because they're black or because they're a marginalized or a lesbian or a gay? You're literally pointing out and making it blatantly obvious that you're observing something in them that you believe, according to this, has greater magnitude than their problem. If it comes up during the course of counseling, I can definitely understand why you would want to address it then. But at the onset of a session sitting down with somebody, I wouldn't think that you'd want to cover any of this. I would think you'd want to say, well, how are you doing today? It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, what are you here for today? What can we talk about? I wouldn't think that you would start out with any of this kind of racism stuff. And then here we'll close with this. For trainers, it means understanding the nature of trainee resistance. So you're the teacher and you're being validated right here at the end. Creating a safe but challenging environment for self-exploration and using intervention strategies to facilitate difficult dialogues on race, gender, sexual orientation, and other socio-demographic dimensions. This chapter is specifically written to help readers understand and overcome their emotive reactions to the substance of the text and the course they're about to take. So that whole first chapter was basically saying, you're going to get mad about it. You're not going to like it. If, you, if that's the case, then you have a problem. Um, you're going to have to get through it. The trainers are right. You're wrong. It's really... It's really strongly <laughs> divisive. It's unbelievable. That's chapter one. Um, and I only highlighted some of it. I, I'll have to wait and see how chapter two goes. Let's take a quick look out of curiosity. Atten attuning to cultural and clinical clues, the harm of cultural insensitivity, individuals' levels, group level, universal level. So anyway, I'll get to chapter two. I may do one of these a week. and uh, and But I am going to try to learn something from this. I mean, I might as well, since I'm kind of taking the class by proxy of reading the book. I would like to read, I like to read um, textbooks anyway, because it's, it's more educating than sometimes in going and taking the class. Um, so I guess that's it. Uh, please leave your comments in the bottom. If you want to get this, I'll leave a link to the Amazon um, page that I got it from. I forget how much it cost. It wasn't that much. I mean, it wasn't a $200 book. It wasn't cheap either. But, um, and I'm, I guess that's it. I, I can't think of what else to say. I had some notes, but I don't think it makes much sense to, to go over them. I, I think the book and chapter one speaks for itself. Thanks for watching.